You are listening to the Wrigleyville Nation podcast. Season ticket holders and lifelong fans with neighborhood ties discuss Cubs news and neighborhood happenings. Here's your hosts, Jeremy and Pat. Hello and welcome to the Wrigleyville Nation podcast. This is episode 302 of the podcast. My name is Jeremy Deemer and I'll be your host. And I'm joined as always by my co-host. He's my cousin and he's high atop Wrigleyville tonight. How's it going, Pat? It's a beautiful, beautiful February evening in Chicago. It's insanely beautiful. Uh, there's uh, looking at uh, photos in my time hop from last year. It was uh, horrifically cold with uh, snow everywhere. Uh, so yeah, definitely enjoying uh, the nice weather. Gets me excited to talk about baseball. So we're back. It's been a while since we had a podcast. So we've got uh, a few things to talk about as we head towards spring training. We get excited for the Cubs season ahead and to help us talk about the Cubs news, thinking about spring training and, and all, all that's happening within baseball. Longtime friend of the show. Welcome back, uh, Matt Clapp. Matt, thanks for taking time out to talk Cubs with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I love being on this show. And we love having you. Um, Pat, let's, uh, <laughs> we were talking right before we started. Uh, Cubs transactions since last we potted has been uh, pretty light. Um, Mark Leiter Jr. was signed to a minor league deal with the Cubs. And he'll go to major league camp to compete for a bullpen job. He is, however, not currently on the Cubs' 40-man roster. Um, does it count as a Cubs transaction when they're the ones that cut him just recently when they had the Eric Hosmer signing? Typically, Jeremy, I would say, no, of course it doesn't count. But I'm going to say it does in this case because when they did cut him from the 40-man roster, I think a lot of us, ourselves included, were a little bit irritated with that because we thought, you know, he seems like he's – found something here and he's actually you know turning into a, a decent pitcher and so it seemed curious that they would let him go we were disappointed at the time that they did and now that they've brought him back i guess we have to stick with our guns and say well good because that's we I, I just did these dreams of him pitching for the cardinals or something and in you know as a setup man and and having the area of like 223 as he you know as he has in fact found himself and and uh, and that we would just have to watch that happen all season so i'm glad we avoided that in this case and i will fully accept the transaction addition of mark Leiter jr the the other move uh to discuss is the signing of michael fulmer who was assigned last week matt uh is he potentially a cubs closer i think he'll be in the mix um i mean this is a guy that's always had really really good stuff um, I, like, I think it's just good for them to have some veteran certainty in the bullpen now. Like I, I'm actually pretty optimistic about how that could shake out when talking the summer and, you know, deep into the season. But I think to start the season, you just didn't have, uh, many guys that you could count on to be at least pretty decent. I think I was like, you know, you hope Brandon Hughes arm hasn't fallen off after how much David Ross used it last year. And then you got, Brad Boxberger, who's usually a pretty solid reliever. Um, but I think Fulmer just adds a guy that, you know, will probably uh, not get shelled and is pretty decent and can close or pitch late innings. And just, I think that really just helps the, uh, you know, hypothetical floor, I guess, of the bullpen early on in the season, especially. He's an interesting case, isn't he, Fulmer? Because he came up mm -hmm. with the Tigers and he was a starter and he was a pretty good starter. I mean, he was an all-star one year. He's fairly effective. But then he kind of deteriorated as, as he went along, and the Tigers were not a great team at the time either. Uh, and then he ended up uh, switching over to the bullpen uh, but two years ago, and that kind of rejuvenated his career a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, I guess you know we'll see what we can get out of him. I will say that I've always thought of Fulmer as kind of a bigger guy, and when mm -hmm. I looked uh, in preparation for the show at his baseball <laughs> reference – Thing. I saw age 29 and I saw 335. I'm like, oh, he's even bigger than I thought. But that was days, <laughs> days. He's, <laughs> the weight was still 224, which I, which I dispute. <laughs> but it's not 335. So I, I apologize in advance. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to get him on the... Go ahead. I'm done. 
Uh, I was going to say I'd like to see him on the Bears' offensive line if he can keep doing that. <laughs> yeah, I was a uh, yeah. I, I saw the signing come through, and I was one of the guys that was rooting for the Cubs to bring back Andrew Chafin instead. Um, is uh, are are were you uh, uh, optimistic that that this could have been uh, uh, Chafin as as the lefty that they brought back instead, uh, Matt? Yeah, I, I've hoped that they would get another lefty in there. Um, I mean, there's still like Matt Moore and Zach Britton and Brad Hand out there, but uh, Chafin just has that you, familiarity. You just, you, just, you just basically ran through my 2014 uh, fantasy <laughs> baseball team, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, Chafin has the familiarity there, and um, he's a guy that you can trust to get out righties or lefties, which I think that's a big thing in today's game is the whole loogie kind of thing is – not nearly as um, effective and useful, really. Um, so I, I I was surprised by how little Chafin signed for. Um, I don't know if he underestimated the market or uh, like maybe his age scared some teams off, but he's just consistently solid. And I would have thought that I, I would have thought he would have been a Cubs, Cubs target, honestly, but. I mean, for six and a half million on a one year deal, it seems like they could have gotten both maybe right well um, there are and, and budgets given, and, <laughs> well how much how much are they paying well i guess hosmer's not getting paid anything technically but right. but you know yeah. what i mean like it, it's it seems like for some of the other minor moves they've made and over the years i, I think of like an uh Andrews and simmons and and you know vr and all these other guys i'm like you know they can afford to spend five or six billion here or there this seems like a time when they really could have solidified their bullpen for real with both guys and i get the whole notion that they just get guys off a scrap heap and and they magically play well but i mean that's not a guarantee i know everybody says well the cubs are good at that are they good at it or are they lucky i don't know like maybe if, if they're good at it this if it works this year maybe they are good at it at some point but but i always like sort of more of the sure thing too a little bit and uh and getting chafin would have helped with that from the left side in particular but i guess he was out of their budget well with self-imposed budget as uh, <laughs> as we were <laughs> pointing out um the uh so looking ahead a little bit uh to this team i do want to talk about some of the rule changes um and how that could help this team going into the new season um banning of the shift is a big uh, rule change this year um at the time a pitch is thrown, all four infielders are required to be on the infield dirt or grass, with two on each side of second base. Players will be able to move as soon as the ball leaves the pitcher's hand. A player who starts an inning at first or second base has to remain on that side of the field for the entire inning, but can switch to short or third base the next inning. If there's an injury mid-inning, then the infield can be reset. So uh, I think this is the one that everyone is hoping will benefit the Cubs, who were already looking to be uh, extremely strong defensively. Uh, now this makes them a uh, a, a top, uh, top-tier top defense. Uh, does it also help their offense, Matt? I think it could help their offense. I mean, uh, like I think you might be able to get more creative with stuff like hit and running too with guys like Nico Horner and uh, <laughs> if, I, if I can say his name, if he's still going to be here, but Nick Madrigal. Um, I don't know what I don't know what role he's going to play on this team, but uh, that's a guy that you can hit and run with and maybe he'll find more holes through the shift and stuff. Um, maybe it's going to help Eric Hosmer and all the ground balls he hits. Um, We'll see. I, I, it's it's so hard to say um, how much that's going to help a particular team offensively unless they're just loaded with left-handed bats that have gotten eaten up in that regard. Um, like you said, I think defensively, this is where having an awesome middle infield is hypothetically a huge advantage um, because, you know, the, it was already a huge advantage, I think, when you have a middle in, infield defense that good. But now when you're asking them to go make plays and the manager can't, you know, place them in a direct place, et cetera. That's such a big thing. Pat, are you, uh, are you hoping that this adds more excitement 
to the game? That's the that's the outcome they're hoping is that there'll be more um, exciting plays here. I suppose, yeah, I like excitement. That'd be good. Um, I think it will help. You know, it's too bad we don't have Kyle Schwarber and Anthony Rissa. I know. Because <laughs> you know the weird part is we've got like two spots open for them right now too, <laughs> where we need left-handed power hitters who also don't have to hit in the shift anymore, and it just frustrates me to think about that. But um, yeah, yeah, uh, I think it'll be good for the Cubs defensively. We'll see how it works. Uh, offensively i mean i guess yeah do some hit running maybe um you know we'll we'll see the cubs offense is going to be an interesting thing to watch this year and and um i wonder sometimes if the shift if if, if eliminating the shift will it should right increase base runners theoretically mm -hmm. by increasing average right and mm -hmm. then when there are more people on base theoretically you would also increase run score, not just from having more people on base for like, you know, single, 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 but you get a couple guys on base and then you get a home run, right? That's the other thing that you can do. But can and this team so, do that? Can, well, can that's the Cubs? question. So, so there may be teams out there that can take advantage, like all teams will to a degree, right? Of, of not having a shift and getting a couple extra base hits, but how do you capitalize on that? And do you capitalize on that by stringing together five straight singles or do you capitalize it on getting a couple uh Balls hit that probably would have been snuffed by the uh, by the shift, but aren't, and then hit a three run home run. You know, is it an Earl Weaver kind of situation? And I guess we'll see how things play out. But in an era now where it seems like we're very power heavy and home run heavy, uh, it, it I think it puts an extra burden on teams to have power hitters who can take advantage of that. And we'll see if the Cubs uh, grow some or develop uh, some. Well, and I think when you're talking about the left handed hitters and the shift and potentially a power guy, that's where you wonder if Matt Mervis is a thing or not, or if he's going to make the team out of spring training. I mean, like, it's just so, so hard to know. The scouting reports are kind of all over the place. Some people are totally buying into the into the numbers and the improve improvements constantly and his strikeout percentage going down, the walking percentage going up. But you, you just don't know until they're facing big league pitching, and especially when you're talking about somebody that wasn't like a top 50 prospect you know so yeah no not even a top 100 prospect really right i mean he he's a guy who who put up fantastic numbers moved very quickly through the system last year he's a real feel-good story you know if, if you can mm -hmm. have that and people got pretty hyped on him and you know it's natural for for teams for fans to get hyped on their own players i haven't seen quite as much um corroboration of that <laughs> from some of the national scouting services i mean nobody thinks he's a bad player per se but but there have been you know, complaints about certain aspects of his swing and things that he might not be able to do. And I think Cubs fans are very defensive about that and say, no, that's not true. You know, he's actually good at that. And, and the proof is in the pudding. But I guess what I would say is that the the team didn't seem as confident as, as the fan base did because they wouldn't have gotten a bunch of more or less like league average first baseman. Like an Eric Hosmer, if you sign an Eric Hosmer, you must feel that there's a potential that Mervis just isn't ready right or isn't going to be able to be a first baseman right um, i mean you you have hosmer you have trey mancini and you still have patrick wisdom in place right. uh like I, I mean i was hoping that they would go after like jose abreu or somebody like that regardless especially with the the dh too but yeah i mean these two moves in the last what month or so would suggest that they're not like totally sold on mervis right away or at least feel that they need that veteran depth and competition and that he might start the season in Iowa or something, but definitely not getting that vibe where they're like, okay, this is our guy, you know, um, they box themselves into a corner where if they're going to keep him on the major league roster, they almost have to cut a veteran then. Right. So right. it makes it, that makes it even harder. And you know, they're Ross and others are, they're not inclined to cut veterans. You saw what they did last year. I mean, it took a long time. It felt like years, but I know it was only months, but it took like half the season before they started cutting some of these veterans who clearly were washed up. And you wonder with a Hosmer, if you'll hear the old, well, you know, you know, he, he's a veteran. He'll get a swing back. You know, this is normal for him, blah, blah, blah. I mean, <laughs> I, I, you, it, it seems like, like Mervis is, it, it'd be one thing if, if they gave it to another fringe player who didn't have much of a pedigree, et cetera. And, and said, well, you know, we can always kick that guy to the curb and, and bring in Mervis if we need to. But the way they've set this up, and, and you know, you're probably not going to get rid of Mancini at all because you actually paid him money. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're 
they did not do Mervis any favors. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and we've seen um, rookies not have uh, immediate success. Uh, we've seen them have a roller coaster experience, and sometimes they have some. You know, we've we've seen uh, the the Rizzo uh, experience when he came up, and he had to be sent back down. We saw uh, guys like Schwarber have to come up and down, and so there there's a lot Ian of Hap. Ian, Ian Hap, Hap. and you know, hundred yeah. percent. So oh, it, Javier Baez. Yeah, Shall you, we keep going? You so got to be ready unless for you're that. Chris Bryant. You know, <laughs> the odds are you're not going to stick for you know. I mean, and, and that's fair, right? Like yep. that's 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 a normal thing. But but it's going to be hard to bring him up and then send him back down because you'll have had to cut someone to do it, and then you know you'll be without a player. So I, I don't know what the plan is. How would I know? <laughs> I mean, whatever. It's the plan. The. <laughs> Uh, one of the plans of Major League Baseball is to reduce the time that it takes for a baseball game to be played. And they're introducing a pitch clock to help do this. So pitchers will have 15 seconds to throw a pitch with the bases empty, 20 seconds when there's a runner on base. Hitters will need to be in the batter's box with eight seconds left on the pitch clock. So we're going to have two clocks, one for the batter and one for the pitcher. Um I'm all for uh, I'm all for moving things along. I don't think that there's anything uh, wrong with uh, uh, with this or uh, anything that could uh, could be weird. Um, I'm I'm excited to see how uh, how this if this actually changes the 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 feel of the pace or not um, to, to to be determined there. Um, and I don't think there's anything. Uh, uh, drastic that could come other other than shaving a few minutes off uh which which i'm fine with the uh with that the other the 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 move that i'm excited to see too is uh pickoffs are changing uh the term is disengagement which consists (laughs) of any time the pitcher makes a pickoff attempt fakes a pickoff or simply steps off the rubber for any reason as well as when the defense requests time Pitchers are allowed two disengagements per plate appearance without a penalty. Um, so already this seems like this is a non-event <laughs> because well, how so, many? So we're, how, how are they going to track that constantly? Like somebody's just going to, an umpire is going to be looking at that all the time and all counting the t- in his head or. It has to be because the the disengagement <laughs> rule resets if a runner or runners advance a base within the same plate appearance. Yeah. So th- <laughs> there's <laughs> this one's uh, pretty sticky. And but I I don't you know the only thing that this addresses is the the time where you throw like six straight pickoff attempts uh, right. to keep a guy at first. That's all really to me that this... That was the part where people booed and the, yep. you know, the home team would boo mm-hmm. and everybody would say, ah, ah. Uh, yeah, we'll miss that. Um, <laughs> I, I, this is a position where I think like if, if only Joe West could come back in an advisory capacity and he could be oh, the God. one who keeps track of that. Can you imagine? <laughs> oh, um, man. The, the the other uh, other rules we have uh, bigger bases. Uh, this is one that uh, I know Theo Epstein was ch- a big champion of uh, this one here. The size of the bases will be increased from 15 inches to 18 inches, in hopes that uh, that extra inch will lead to more stolen bases. Will lead to uh, 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 oh, of course, safety. That's what uh, it's all. It's all about uh, uh, being safety. But I, I think that uh, once you get more hits, because you get to first base faster. Because you get to all the bases faster. You get right? all. The, I mean, all the bases faster. I mean, all those bang bang plays at first. You you have an extra inch or two now. That you know, a couple inches to if you, you play it right. So, I I hope that it also um, lessens those stupid slide replays where a guy's like hand comes off for like a millisecond and yes, they call him out yes. after replay like something that you would never ever call in real time at any level you know right in fact interestingly that only happens to cubs run uh base runners did you know that i i, I swear it feels like uh, that. that's been my experience uh, <laughs> uh, and then uh no more position players pitching the uh the previous rule allowed them to use one 
when up or down by six or more runs. Uh, Jesse Rogers, ESPN, currently re is reporting that the sides are discussing a tweak in which the leading team would have to be up by as many as 10 or more runs, while the trailing team would have to be down by eight or more runs in order to pitch a position player. The league and players are finalizing a new rule. Um, the Twitter account at Codify Baseball posted stats about uh, about this and what they're trying to address here is uh, uh, there was position players pitching. 1982 gave up no hits. 1992, one home run. 2002, one single and one home run. 2012, nine singles, six doubles, two home runs. 2022, 132 singles, 42 doubles, two triples, and 48 home runs. I mean, we're we're keeping we're keeping out stars from the Hall of Fame because of uh, inflated stats, right? So, um, you know, it seems to me that this is an integrity of the game issue. It yeah. So so basically, there's too many terrible teams. There's too many lopsided games now to where players are pitching all the time and they're these numbers are absolutely getting inflated um yeah i think it's it's fun you know it's fun to see it happen and just see just total chaos and arcade baseball here and there but yeah those numbers are probably a bit much over a full season especially uh i, I i'm okay with this one i guess you know they, you got to probably do something about that and that's just getting to be a bit much. My thought is for every time a team brings a pitcher into pitch, a home team, um, then the fans and attendance of the game get 5% of their ticket price back for the, uh, <laughs> for the lack of uh, effort at, at trying to have a competitive <laughs> ball game. That's fine with me. Keep going then. Because yeah, I've been at a couple of those games. And, you know, it's fun once in a while, but at uh -huh. some point it gets pretty brutal when, you know, you've got, you're bringing in, Somebody who's given up a three-run home run, and now you're instead of down eleven to two, and now you're down like fourteen to two, and <laughs> you're sitting there, and you're like, "Will this ever end?" You know? And then they're going to the next position player to try to get out of it. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So those are those are the new rules. Um, <laughs> and uh, so the other piece of news. Uh, other piece of, I wouldn't call it news. I would call it more uh, 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 discussion uh, besides the rule changes was uh, Jim Bowden's article from The Athletic where uh, he posted a look at realignment. If baseball moved to 32 teams. So <laughs> uh, I wanted to get uh, your, your take on what this looks like. Uh, in the Midwest division, he proposed the Cubs, Sox, Brewers, and Twins together in in one division matt uh if they do move to 32 teams would uh would a geographic realignment like this uh, breaking up some rivalries like <laughs> cubs cardinals uh etc would that uh is that something you'd be uh you'd be okay with or uh want to try to keep as many of those rivalries intact i mean it's nice to have the rivalries i think for sure especially when you're talking cubs cardinals and I guess Cubs Brewers are the last 20 years now. Um, that kind of stuff's fun. You have a bigger thing with the White Sox, an actual reason to really hate each other, I guess, for once, right? Besides just the city thing. Um, so, yeah, I, first of all, or what I was going to go back to, um, there, there was one division in there that just totally made me laugh my ass off when I first saw it. It was like the, the Mid-Atlantic, I think. It was like, <laughs> yes, like the, the Pirate. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the Orioles the pirates and the nationals with an expansion team in Charlotte <laughs> being, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's I mean, the nationals. Solution. If they, if they play their cards, right. The nationals could win 130 games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, some of those were pretty, pretty, uh, I don't know about it. Or the, the Rockies were in like the Pacific coast division or something like, yes, the Rockies but, athletics Mariners and the San Francisco giants. So. Yeah. But generally speaking, I mean, you could, you could convince me on something like that when talking to Cubs and the rivalries and everything, as long as you can get it all geographically to make sense and the, with the playoff format and everything. But I, I thought that particular setup was a bit, 
uh, yeah, I don't know. Some of those would be really unappealing, I think. Oh, none, none more unappealing than the East Division of the Boston Red Sox, the New York Mets, the New York Yankees, and the <laughs> Philadelphia Phillies. Pat, that's your nightmare division. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. That's the, whole, the only reason I would do this entire failed experiment would be to watch those four clowns play each other continuously throughout the entire season. Great. Bring it on. Um, no, I. what I would say, I think, is that it's does, it does strike me as a bit of an unfair advantage for teams if you're playing another team in your own city. Like, I can see the Cubs and Brewers being in the division because in technically, you know, you can go up there, like a fan can go up there and back in a day, but the team is going to stay there, right, overnight. Um, it's a huge advantage if you're playing divisional games and you get to sleep in your own bed and you get to stay home uh, as opposed to teams that never have that opportunity. So I don't know if there's... And there's an equity argument to stop this disaster from occurring, but that would be that would be my my suggestion is that you'd have to break up the Mets and Yankees, Cubs and Sox, you know, I don't know, Dodgers and you know, I don't even know if their traffic out there is so bad, but uh, you know, you, you break you break up these these teams so that they didn't have quite the the same uh, advantage there. Plus, it's it, isn't it fun? To, I, I think it's fun to go watch your team play. Out of town. I don't, I don't think I'd enjoy playing the White. Well, I know I would not enjoy playing the White Sox. I, I don't like playing them four times a year or six times a year, let alone however many we'd have to in this scenario. But uh, break it up. Put the Cubs and the Cardinals and the Brewers and the Twins together. Let the White Sox play with uh, Cleveland and Detroit and the Indianapolis team or whatever if they have one at that point or Cincinnati. I don't care. I will say though, I, I would I would be sad to lose the uh, Pirates and Reds from the division because yes, that's yes. just such a nice advantage. I mean, if you really want to get down <laughs> to brass tacks, I think the Pirates, Reds, Cubs, Tigers, and Royals might be a good division. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> I I do like the idea. I I think that. You know the everything I'm seeing that the Nashville expansion is uh, there. Where, where there's smoke, there's fire. There, uh, it seems like they are a a real front runner for for a team. Um, but I think all expansion has to be. Uh, I, I think all that has to be on hold until you figure out what's going on with Oakland. And well, if, yeah. if Denver. If Denver is in fact Chicago West and Milwaukee is Chicago North, Nashville is Chicago South. Sure, yeah, and, and mm-hmm. I'm all in favor of that. that. That's one of my favorite trips. But uh, so. uh, with Oakland seemingly having to move somewhere, uh, that's I think that's got to get uh, addressed soon. I, I don't think that they're uh, long for for Oakland. Uh, yeah, you don't have to yeah. go home, but you can't stay here. I think it's the song <laughs> playing in Oakland right now. <laughs> Um, so where are they going to go? Vegas, right? Aren't they? That's been the rumor that there's been some, like, they've been having stadium site talk and all sorts of things. It's just, I feel like it's been lining up to that, but I I haven't checked in on how quote official all that is lately, but that's been the rumor for a bit. So the teams, the the cities that we think teams might, we might be able to house a team would be Nashville. What? Charlotte, maybe Charlotte is is on this list. Charlotte. Uh, Vegas, Vegas. Um, yeah. I've always thought Port- Portland might be one eventually, but I don't know. Yeah, hopefully not like another Florida team, right? They they no. have trouble with the ones they have. Oh, I hope not. Yeah, like I know Jacksonville has people in it, but so what? <laughs> um, so does Miami, you know, and that doesn't help. I, I'm I'm glad. That, so Indianapolis is off the list, right? They, they, you don't hear a lot about it. Good, because you used to like thirty years ago. You know when they were doing all the expansion teams. Montreal is also on that list. Yes, uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, Montreal would be perfect. They but deserve one. We should avoid Indianapolis at all costs. I mean, on the one <laughs> hand, it's it's easy to get to because we could drive there, which is great. But then we'd have to like eat at Applebee's or whatever when we got there. So that, I mean, it just it defeats the purpose of traveling to another city. Um, so please, no Indianapolis. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, we've got, so we're, we're running up to spring training. Um, and so, uh, running or, or, or sauntering? <laughs> oh no, no, we're running because okay. you, you, thinking about it, I was thinking about it today as I was, uh, getting ready to talk to you guys. Did. 
Uh, I was getting ready to talk to you <laughs> fellas and uh, getting excited about uh, spring training. I was thinking about like, yeah, this has been, we haven't had a regular spring training in uh, over three years. So uh, is, last it, is that true? Yeah, because oh, you had the COVID of the, year, of the, yeah, and then you had labor strife, labor strife, the, right? And, yeah, and the 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 lockout there kept uh, yeah. the spring training last year off the table, yeah. uh, so it was a very shortened spring training. So this is a first full one we've had in years. So uh, um, looking at the schedule, Marquee Sports Network will be airing twenty nine of the thirty three Cubs nice. games. Uh, taking place in spring training of the four I mean, they other... should right because because that's all they do is show Cubs games you'd you think they would have yeah. enough room for content <laughs> yeah Maybe uh, what else are they showing? Uh, of the four remaining contests uh, two will be on the MLB network the February 26th and March 11th against the Dodgers and then the other two are split squads that will not air on television so um, you'll be able to see almost all of the spring training games and it Asterisk if you have access to Marquee. Uh, so the uh, uh, looking at this team and looking ahead, uh, Matt, what are some of the uh, what are some of the, the, the stories, the players? What are some of the things you're looking forward to most in the upcoming spring training for the Cubs? Uh, well, geez, I mean, there's so many things. For one, I would we were talking about him earlier, but Matt Mervis, I think, is one thing and uh, if he, is he going to force the issue? Is he going to really stand out? Uh, do they already have a plan for him to maybe start in Iowa? That's one thing. Uh, another Cody Bellinger is, is his swing looking any cleaned up or, you know, are they finding something in there that we're talking about a guy that was a total superstar what like three, four years ago and has so been, I a... drafted him on my fantasy baseball team and then <laughs> yeah. he, yeah. he, he then started he... being a pre-cub. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Then he turned into like Albert Almora. So yeah. Uh, um, so that's another one. Uh, I think the bullpen situation, the pitching staff as a whole, because I think I, I would guess that Drew Smiley's probably got a rotation spot, I would assume. Mm-hmm. Um, so but you're still lacking one spot for sure, because we don't, we have no idea what's going on with Kyle Hendricks and his health. And if he's going to is he going to pitch a hundred plus innings for this team? Or is he not going to pitch at all? Like that's been really, really vague. Um, and then you're talking about like Hayden Wesneski. Is, is he going to make the rotation out of spring training or is he going to start in the bullpen? Uh, they already, they're probably already going to have Alzali and Keegan Thompson in the bullpen where you already have two of those guys. They can give length with probably really good max effort stuff that are also capable of, you know, like I said, they can give length, they can be, piggyback relievers they can be late inning relievers uh that would give him a ton of creativity like the rays um but maybe they want him starting in the rotation uh adrian sampson is he going to be part of the rotation what like he did so much last year that he probably deserves a chance but there's going to be a lot of people that are not buying it too so uh are they going to see that through i mean it's up and down like that i think and with so many young arms potentially in the bullpen like jeremiah estrada is he going to is he going to be part of it or um, is Mark Leiter Jr. going to make it? He was like you guys talked about. I mean, I think the Zips project- projections had him as the best reliever on the team right. and they were willing to let him go. So um, I, like there's so many guys like that, that you just, we don't really know what they are. Um, and we probably won't after March either, but they're going to get a chance to really establish roles and, we're going to get all the best shape of his life reports. Um, oh, so, and so yeah. too. It is that time of name, year. <laughs> name, name three people who will be in the best shape of their life. <laughs> I mean, Eric um, Cosmer I'll, better be. Eric Cosmer better be, right? I'm Eric Cosmer. Shape of his life. Absolutely. I'm going to go with uh, Manny Rodriguez. will probably be one of them. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, let's see. Is, uh, is by any chance, uh, well, let's see. Is... Marcus Strobel gonna be in the best shape of his life. <laughs> it's not the, not in the best Twitter shape of his life, I think. Yeah, uh, right, right. He's, he hasn't and been making then, many people happy with that. No, and then the final one for me would be, I mean, you could always go with like one of the veterans, like a Trey Mancini. will be obviously he'll be in the best shape of his life, but um, or one of the catchers. But who cares? Uh, so. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna go with like uh, like a Braylon Marquez or like uh, Amaya, somebody somebody who's like broken in half and will be now be in the best shape of his life because he's been glued back together. That's that's my. Oh, uh, we gotta have 
one of the young guys who's been hurt a lot, right? Brennan Davis. Something yeah. like that. Got to be the best shape of their life. Something. I'll go with one more, Justin Steele, because oh, I think yeah. – he, uh, I mean, he was awesome last year, but he's he's gone on over and over lately about how many more innings he wants to throw and this and that. And yeah, I think he yeah. could have still he could still get in better shape. Like ideally, it's not a huge thing for a pitch all the time, but you know, I think we saw like Keegan Thompson last year look like looking like a fitness freak, and those two are always yeah. hanging around each other. So I, I think that you could see him getting in better shape too. Good call. Good call. Oh, I I bet a, a Nick Madrigal best shape of his life coming <laughs> off of. Uh, yeah, don't worry, he's not going to get hurt this time. We swear. <laughs> After having both legs replaced or whatever. Uh, well, well, what's I honestly have? I really thought that they would trade him, and I'm not even one of these people that mocks him all the time. Or I think that there's still a chance that he could be a 300 hitter again or whatever. And he, his contact in today's game is a nice, nice uh, change of pace from so many strikeouts and everything. But I, I'm just having a hard time seeing his fit on this team, especially like they've talked about him playing third base. But I, can you can you throw from third base? You, um, you already have a Christopher Morel that we're trying to wheel right. into third base, right? Right. So well, and don't I forget mean, they've got Zach McKinstry. They've got right. you know Bodie is somewhere hanging around still, I think. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, and and who's the guy they picked up? The other guy who is only a sort of the same profile. Um, um I'm trying to think. I can't even keep track. <laughs> I know they got him this off season. That's that's the worst part uh, of it all. Um, I apologize for that, but but if you know who he is and you know what I'm talking about, he's uh, <laughs> you know he's he's one of these similar type people and yeah, uh, uh, Master Brony. Yes, that's right. That guy is actually I think projected for like one of their highest on base percentages on yeah on the whole yeah. team. So good but, or bad, I don't know. But yeah, yeah. Um, but. Yeah, I, I'm just having a hard time seeing how magical fits. I know you can mix him into the DH or put him at second base and so-and-so can get a day off, but you really want to try to maximize Dansby Swanson and Nico Horner all that you can, you know. Um, that's that's how your team is going to be good, really, is those two up the middle is the biggest strength. Yeah, I don't think you can play him there. And the thought when they got him was that maybe they could play him at second and Horner and center, but I think we're mm-hmm. off that now, you know, a year later. And right. the other thought they had when they got him was, oh, maybe he could be a DH. He could be an un. He could be one of those unconventional DHs who hits three fifty, and right. he hits two fifty is the problem, right? <laughs> and he has no power, so those DHs yeah. are not necessary. Um, right, and he doesn't walk a lot either, so he's he's no, got to no. he's got to hit like two ninety plus always, and that like yeah, that's just really hard to do, and especially if your body's breaking down like that. So I mean, I'm I'm fine with him getting a look because uh, I. I don't think that his value could be, I mean, it's got to go up. You probably can't get much. I'm, I'm sure they've offered him up in trades. Right. So uh, might as well get him some at bats earlier in a DH role or something and pray that he starts hitting and then he should be very available in a trade I, again, I think. I could see him as a starting middle infielder in like maybe 1978. Yeah. Well, he's you know, a, his extra. Problem everyone was is... smaller. Everyone was smaller then. They didn't. They didn't actually count walks, or they didn't. You know, they didn't worry about that. You know, he'd have been all right back then. His extra problem is that he's not fast. It's not right. like right. it's not like he also adds a stolen base dimension. Uh, or he, he has. He's not. He's not a speed guy either. So it's it's literally hit three hundred or. He was successful on seventy five percent of his steal attempts last year. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> three out of four. <laughs> but yeah do you really want him steal it running anyway given the fact that his legs don't work right so yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um yeah so that's uh, uh i had a question for you too matt about uh, uh say a suzuki for me he's he's who i'm looking for uh in spring training what is uh uh, after his first season in america in with in the major league baseball how does he uh, now that the league is uh, has got a book on him? How is he going to play? How is he going to adjust? What is what is he doing to continue his improvement? Uh, I think he's a huge key to this team being successful. If if Say Suzuki is exactly what he was last year, good. But I think everyone's expectations are uh, he's got to exceed what he put up last year. Yeah, I, I I would bet right now that he's the best hitter on the team. Um, I like Ian Happ is 
I think pretty underrated in that regard. And he's probably going to, you know, have his 800 plus OPS kind of stuff and be a solid hitter. But um, I'm, I'm buying on Seiya Suzuki. Uh, I think you saw for a few months there, you saw how good he can be. Um, and I mean that he was hitting like a top 20 hitter in baseball for a few months there. And you also saw the months where he had to adjust back um, and the league found some holes and et cetera. But I, I really thought that he adjusted back pretty well himself. And I feel like he got screwed over. This is anecdotal stuff, but I swear to God, like he got more awful called strikes on like what could have been oh, walks absolutely. in the at bat. And absolutely. Um, like I Worst think robots, league. yeah, I feel like robots would have like moved his walk percentage up 2% and his strikeouts down 2%, you know? Um, but I, I just think that the ability is there and the computers all think that too. Um, he's got pretty, pretty high projections. Um, easily the best on the team, and I, I honestly wouldn't bet against it myself. Now, who knows? Maybe some the league finds some other holes, and he has to adjust back again. But um, I think he's a legitimately really good hitter and potentially a star hitter. And I think he's a better right fielder than he showed last year. I think we saw his defense start to look a little more confident as the year went along. And um, I mean, you have to keep in mind the communication and just all these things are new. All the stadiums are new um there's just like so many things there that i think that the average person doesn't really keep in mind where I, I just felt like if you watched him in april and just his demeanor and everything april and may versus later in the season like he just looked like he felt like he belonged just the way he carried himself both offensively and defensively and i think we'll start to see him put it together pretty consistently this season i agree with you 100 percent about how he got jobbed on calls and it reminds me a little bit of two other former Cubs, uh, lefties actually, but like, remember, uh, Fukudome got that treatment and even Schwarber, like they were very mm -hmm. patient hitters and the empires were just too, uh, fallible and, uh, and they couldn't keep up with, you know, I mean, they were, they had worse eyes than the hitters. <laughs> I feel like that happened with <laughs> Suzuki last year too. He was just, he was better at, at balls and strikes than the home plate umpires were. And he really got jobbed, uh, especially in some full counts. And, you know, it's just, that was rough. And, and, what you don't want is you don't want them to then, you know, expand the strike zones too much and then get exposed that way too. So it's, but it's really hard to tell somebody you're doing the right thing, keep it up as they're getting called out on strikes <laughs> that are, you know, six inches, nine inches off the plate, uh, which happened to him quite a few times. But as far as his overall performance, his numbers don't look quite as good, obviously, because he had fewer than 400 at bats. So 14 homers, you know, 46 rubies doesn't seem that great. And, his OPS, while well, great early in the year, you know, did dip quite a bit in the middle. But yeah, he's he'll even if he if he played exactly the way he did last year, but for a full season, I think the numbers would feel better. Mm -hmm. But I also think that the Cubs signed him with the expectation, I think, I believe, uh, that he will do better than he did in his first year. Like that's the adjustment year, and then this year, you know, you get that uh, on base, you know, plus slugging percentage and. And you go from what seven seventy up to maybe you know eight hundred ish, right, or a little right. over eight hundred. I'd, I'd like to see him with an OPS of over eight hundred. How about that? That's a goal of mine for him. Not that yeah. he cares. Uh, and that would be a good sign offensively. That's showing me that he's either making enough contact, making enough hits, but also you know driving the ball a little bit too, and and um, and, and getting the walks he deserves. That that's that's a good number for him. And as far as the defense is concerned, um, I agree with you. I think his defense is probably better than it looks, but boy, that for whatever reason, like the advanced metrics really torched him on defense. And, you know, we, we rely on the advanced <laughs> metrics when it helps us. So it's kind of like <laughs> when it hurts us, we're like, Oh no, the, the human eye is better than the advanced metrics. So I, I mean, in fairness, I think if we're going to accept advanced metrics and I know fielding metrics are a little bit kind of up and down, but if we're going to, if we're going to accept it and say that that makes Nico Horner great, or that makes mm -hmm. Anthony Swanson great, do we also have to say, well, that is a concern for Suzuki and, right. you know, so, so let's see how that plays out. We've got plenty of time. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not like you, I'm not super worried. It's not like he's a butcher, right? Like, so that's not the issue. The issue is can he maximize um, the defense a little bit more? Cause that would add some value to him too. That, that actually he had negative war last year on defense. So that I think, right. So right. that would actually en enhance his value again if we could uh if that could happen so if you know yeah, anybody I... who works in advanced uh fielding metrics maybe <laughs> dan zaborski or somebody 
please tell them to recalibrate their machines and give <laughs> Suzuki higher ratings. Thank you. Yeah, well, I think what you said too, I mean, if, if he was even like a league average defender and then you have his offensive numbers of last year and say he plays 130 plus games last year, that's like a three and a half plus war player. And I think that he's got, He's got more in the bat. Like you, you can see all of the abilities clear as day. I think you can see yeah. why he was so highly thought of, and like it's in there. It's not like uh, oh, maybe he could be this or that. Like he can absolutely be that good. Um, so yeah, I think that's that wasn't like fluky. His peak, you know, right. his his ceiling. That's more like, mm-hmm. gee, that's kind of almost his floor, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, we are. Uh... Running up on time, Pat. Any last questions from you for Matt before we call it a podcast? Um, I guess uh, I would just say, Matt, what is your overall? If you, I mean, I know it's early and we haven't seen all the players in the best shape of their lives, but <laughs> if you had to take a, a guess right now at at the Cubs' fortunes this season, like where do you see this team finishing up roughly? In, 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 keep uh, in mind we're. We're, we're in, a, in a balanced league schedule, so those Reds and Pirates games are going to be fewer and farther between, alas. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that they're – this is going to – you're going to hate me for this big of a range, but I think they're anywhere from like a 75 to 85 win team. Like I, I And I would 85. pick them pr- – I, okay. I think that's, that's like good. if every if everything – a lot of things went well. Like if you got a pretty good Cody, Cody Bellinger and you got a 5-6 war, Danzy B. Swanson again – and if you got maybe a Brennan Davis or some guy we're not really counting on or Matt Mer- Mervis, like they, there's, there is that ability there. And I think their run p- prevention and um, pitching staff as a whole, I think is going to be better than the computers think. And I think that they're going to pr- like, you never know in one run games and that's so much random luck and whatnot usually. But I think hypothetically with defense and improved base running, like Bellinger and Swanson are really good at base running too. So they added some guys that do a lot of the little things well where, um, I think that they may be like a, a pretty good team in one run games and may steal a couple of games that they didn't in the last couple of years. Um, but if things don't go well, that's where they can be in the mid seventies or, I mean, I'm also talking like if they're pretty healthy, if like say a Suzuki or Nico Horner, or Dansby Swanson, Marcus Stroman, somebody got like a catastrophic injury or whatever, then obviously that's going to lower things potentially even more. But yeah, they don't um, have I do... the depth obviously to, to, deal with a lot of that right 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 so like i said i i would pick like 80 wins today i think 78 is like the the over under ish spot i think that's what zips has him at too to me that sounds about right and i'll bump them up a couple of wins just because i think they're gonna be a good run prevention and base running etc kind of team yeah the real key there is where are they as the trade deadline approaches because they do mm-hmm. have a lot of guys that have one two year deals here that they will be actively trying to flip and they will get <laughs> potentially uh significantly worse they could be on that 70 some win pace and then completely end up uh, uh back where they were last year if right. they don't feel that uh that, that, that they're ready to add uh, or be competitive here uh, so it's right a- that's exactly exactly it i mean like ian happ is one guy that really stands out um, if you're out of the race and you don't think you're signing to an extension, that's a guy that could be traded in. Um, I mean, I don't know if there's going to be that many other good bats available as trade deadline, especially after Devers signed his extension. Uh, Manny Machado is not going to go anywhere, at least until after the season. Um, I don't think that like Otani a whole different discussion in every sure, way. Yeah. You know? So, so I, I think that if the Cubs were the out, Cubs aren't getting out, Otani because he's too expensive. <laughs> How about that? You're not comfortable with that eleven year deal. Yeah. Uh but like oh uh Ian Happ, if the Cubs were out of it, could be one of the most interesting bad additions at the deadline. He's also a guy maybe they want to try to sign an extension. Like how they're doing in that I I don't know, it's it's so hard to say say and I could actually see them in a spot where they um are considering trading like a veteran reliever or two, like Brad Boxberger or Michael Fulmer or you know, one of those guys but also potentially buying they need they need to be like considering buying frontline pitching and bats for the long term no matter what the record is this year i think that that's something that they need to have their eyes open for if some frontline kind of starting pitcher comes becomes available um or some bat because right now like i said next offseason doesn't really look that great 
the free agency front. So they're probably going to have to trade for one, one or two eventually to get that like next level bat that they, they feel like a bat or two short like that. And they're kind of filling it out with the, you know, Mancini Hosmer level guys right now. I was very um, confused when Jed Hoyer had said just a couple days ago that he doesn't like negotiating extensions during spring training because it, you know, the, the obviously the follow up to that is, well, do you ever? Like, I mean, what does yeah. training have to do with it? You know, <laughs> I I think he needs to be very serious about trying to, to extend Nico Horner at least because I think that that's one where uh, there should be some common ground there. And that's that's going to be a player that's probably never going to be treated like a, a superstar on the market, even if his numbers suggest he should be. Um, I, like, as much as everybody hates it, I, I, I sort of understood letting a lot of the past core walk and some of the numbers since have suggested maybe they had a good, good point on a few of those at least. Um, but I think Nico Horner just lines up as the kind of guy that's not going to be a crazy contract. And it's just the kind of guy you want to build around. Like, I don't know if you guys saw PCA, Pete Crow Armstrong had a quote like earlier today about how um, Nico is just kind of like everything that the Cubs should be going forward and just the way he plays and on both sides. And like, I think that's eventually you got to yeah. try to make a point. You got to, you got to make a, a point to your farm system, to the fan base, et cetera, that like, this is the kind of guy we want to build around. And this is the kind of culture we want to have. And, you know, this is the, you, eventually your prospects got to also think that they're playing for a uh, yeah, potential contract and to be a long term right. cub, et cetera. Or like too, a so. pirate, you know, or somebody right. Or red. Right. Um, so there's it, go ahead. You no, know, I, you, I, I think you're really onto something, which is that after the Wilson situation last year, when, you know, love them or not, you know, they let them walk for nothing, um, just like they kind of gave about Schwarber. But, uh, you know, Wilson had value and they just mm-hmm. didn't want to keep it for whatever reason. And that's fine. You can get rid of all your good players, but guess what? Then you have to go get new ones. And the new ones are really expensive, as we found out on the free right. Asian market this year. When everybody was complaining about how, oh, I don't want to pay that. I don't want to pay an extra year for a Brayu. Okay, well, then you get Eric Hosmer. How do you like that? <laughs> that's, that's how the market works in real life. Exactly. Folks. You know, so you have to pay lots of money to people in free agency because they have you. Uh, in a in a tough place, right? Because they've got bunches of people who are going to pay them money. And we saw time after time after time when the Cubs lost out on free agents, it was because the Cubs are, ah, it seems a little bit expensive for us. Well, you know, that's fine, but you can't have it both ways. You can't get, well, you can't let all your good players walk and also then say, but we're too afraid to sign anybody else. Now they got Dansby Swanson. So they're, you know, they'll, they'll hold on to that for as long as they can as a, as a signing. But <laughs> no, I mean, they will, right? But it was like, over the last two years, he was shortstop number seven, I guess. So they got one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but had he been shortstop number one, they sure as hell would have not gotten him, right? And that mm-hmm. goes for outfielders and for catchers and for every other position. They've never gotten the, the top guy out there. And for whatever reason, they didn't even want to trade for like a Sean Murphy or whatever who got sold for peanuts, it seemed like. But but so you have to you have to pick a lane here. And the lane is either going to be give some extensions to the guys who are good clubhouse guys who you like who are productive even if you have to pay them a little bit of money or go on the free agent market and pay you know question mark you know any amount of you, you, the hope is always well, we'll get a big bargain but these days bargains right. don't seem to exist as much so you're going to probably overpay is what's going to really happen in real life or you end up with nobody right and i mean i understand like i said with some of the past contracts and just when you're looking at some of these things on paper you know is is this projected war or OPS or blah, 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 going to be that good in three years. But the, like they're at a point now where there's the human side of this and you have Ian Happ and Nico Horner's two examples of guys that are like the like classic clubhouse culture guys. And they're, this is what your prospects should wanting to be looking up to. And you want to say that this is the kind of organization we're going to build going forward. So I just, I just think that there's a lot of like unquantifiable value and those kind of players and making those kind of statements, putting aside what it does to the fan base, you know, and saying that we're going to try to keep our own. And if they, if they demonstrate, they represent what's good about being a Chicago Cub and everything that we want to keep them. Like there's just a lot of value in that stuff. I think when you're talking about years of avoiding this now that you should really like, they should probably be more mindful of that and not just stick by what the spreadsheet says at this point. Matt, always a pleasure. The time flies when we get to talk Cubs with you. So uh, please remind our listeners where they can follow you on Twitter and find all your work on the internet for both Cubs and Bears. 
Yeah, you can. Uh, I, I'm an editor and writer at um, the Comeback and AwfulAnnouncing.com. And then you can also follow my accounts at the Blog Finds for the Cubs and then for the Bears, uh, Da Bear Nesses. Um, you can just find one of my profiles and I got all that information in there. And yeah, I'm all over the place. <laughs> and you've got some of the best Twitter uh, content out there. Absolutely. So. Yes. Thank you. Um, a, a especially you know, during games, but also. Uh, when games i don't know how you do it you, you're just on twitter 24 7 because you're always available to, to give some insight which is uh which is very helpful i appreciate that and you can follow us for less insightful content than matt but uh, definitely support <laughs> us at wrigleyville nat for both twitter and instagram facebook.com slash wrigleyville nation as well always a good time catching up with matt clap uh let's Get ready to wrap this up, but before we do, Pat, we've got news. We've got a oh, uh, uh, we've got some news. I, uh, a new signing, a new signing for the Cubs. Uh, no, but it, uh, the rumor mill is is turning. Uh, that uh, this is some off the field news. That uh, you you have some sort of uh, uh, some sort of announcement you could make. I, I've heard I've heard there's some rumblings that you're involved in something politically at this point. Yeah, that's that's true story. True story. Um, I'm actually running for alderman of the 46th ward, which is the ward that surrounds Wrigley Field, but conveniently, unfortunately, does not include Wrigley Field. But it's uh, to the east, to the north, and to the west, and a little bit to the south. Um, and we have an election coming up. It's a city municipal election. People have probably heard there's a election for mayor in Chicago, and they do these things at the same time. So the election is actually February 28th. And if people want to learn more about your positions, uh, how you're going to help the 46 Ward, they can go to patricknagel46.com. That's got all that information and how uh, they can help uh, as we're, we're in the final push here for, uh, for the campaign as we head up to Election Day. Yeah, and if there are any voters in the war, that, that feel free to, uh, to cast your ballot for me, too, if you, if you feel like you'd like to. Um, I, uh, I would appreciate any and all support as we continue to try to make the neighborhood a better place, both on the field and off the field, literally. Well, it's, uh, yeah, definitely exciting. We'll, uh, we'll keep, uh, the other listeners posted. Yeah. If you're in the 46th, uh, definitely, uh, show your support, uh, for, for Pat. And if you are, uh, uh, uh listening outside of the, the 46th, we'll keep you posted on, uh, on how things go as we head up to election day. So there, there are many ways you can support the campaign. So, um, you know, any op- any anything you can do would be helpful. And uh, do we have a uh, the the Twitter uh, handle as well? Is uh, Nagel for forty six? So you can also yes, uh, N A G L E for forty six. Excellent, forty six. Yeah, I'm very excited. Not a lot of baseball, baseball. Not a lot of baseball comment content on there, but you know, we we do our best. Absolutely. So yeah, no, that's uh, that's exciting. Best of luck. We're, we're looking forward to uh, uh, to election day. And now with that, we're going to call it a podcast. We have a Patreon, patreon.com slash Wrigleyville Nation. That's how we keep this show ad free every single year because of your support. So thank you to all of our patrons who continue to keep us ad free going into uh, yet another season with where, where we don't have to reach out to all of those sponsors that you hate hearing from on podcasts. <laughs> and uh, with that, we're going to wrap it up. Make sure you stay subscribed to the podcast as uh, we will be dropping episodes with more frequency as we get closer and closer to the start of the regular season. So make sure you're subscribed anywhere podcasts are found. We also have a YouTube channel, uh, Wrigleyville Nation podcast over at YouTube. Throw us a subscription there as well. That helps us work the algorithm so other Cubs fans can find the show. And with that, all the links, everything I described, the entire back catalog of this podcast, all available at the website, WrigleyvilleNation.com. And with that, we're calling it a podcast. Pat, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we'll talk to you again next time.